the outline in the chat box, but just some quick housekeeping matters, kindly requesting all participants to ensure your mics are muted and your camera is switched off. Uh, after this record, this recording is rather currently streaming live on Dawn's YouTube and Facebook social media pages. Uh, the discussions for today will run for an hour and a half. Um, we have five speakers who will be sharing their views on the topic. Each speaker is given seven minutes following the presentation. We will open up the Q&A for questions. Uh, if you wish to ask your question, please post your question in the Q&A box uh, and our moderator will attend to your question. If you wish to ask a live question, please do so by raising your hand. You would be asked to, in so by doing an introduction, your name, your organization, and the moderator will ask you to have your question. Thank you very much. And it's over to Marioni who would be moderating this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joey, uh, for that um, welcome. Um, Pacific greetings to everybody. I'm Marioni Chung and I'm associate with Dawn. And it's my uh, pleasure to be the moderator for our event today. So um, deep sea mining is currently advancing in the Pacific. And if it goes ahead, it will destroy marine biodiversity and um, marine life in the area of the planet that we still know too little about and interfere with the ocean systems that are vital to storing carbon and therefore regulating climate, with potentially enormous consequences. The livelihoods, health, and well being of women, indigenous people, and island and coastal communities across the world, and especially for small island developing states. Experimental seabed mining could commence in the international waters governed by the International Seabed Authority as early as next year, with risks to the planet's largest ecosystem. It could be it could also be fatal to fisheries, the food security of coastal and island communities. Under the UN Convention on uh, the Law of the Sea, resources in the deep seabed beyond national jurisdictions constitute the common heritage of mankind. This common heritage of mankind is narrowly interpreted to mean all member states of the ISA should benefit equitably from the exploitation of seabed minerals in our oceans. Our discussions today will contest this equality perspective and the instrumentalization of gender equality in deep sea mining agendas. The International Seabed Authority and industry players have been highlighting how they are creating opportunities for women marine scientists in deep sea mining. The ISA in their 2021 report claimed to be contributing to the SDG goal five on gender equality and industry players such as the metal metals company, formerly known as Deep Green, and their salesmen, the international Danish architect firm known, known as BIG, sell D DSM as key building blocks for green technological revolution to address the climate crisis we currently face. The ISA has issued 31 exploration contracts to corporations sponsored by ISA member states and is pushing to conclude negotiations on mining, on a mining code to enable mining to commence as early as next year. Before, as our speakers are presenting on various issues to consider, I would invite the participants to consider, to ponder on these questions. Who really stands to gain from the exploitation of our ocean or our, on the exploitation of our ocean minerals? Unchecked, Weekly regulated corporate power poses serious threats to women, women's human rights. How does DSM impact women's access to common property, healthy natural environments, public resources and provisioning when mining privatizes, destroys, alienates and further industrializes our oceans? And what about women's access to basic goods, social services and healthy oceans with the supposed gender equality benefits of deep sea mining? It's against this backdrop that Dawn and Pang and many others share serious concerns for deep sea mining. It's irreversible harm to biodiversity with little to zero likelihood of recovery. 
the and the unseemly haste with which Pacific states and recently formed mining companies who appear to be venture capitalists fundraising for expected huge returns on experimental mining are pushing ahead for deep sea mining in the Pacific Ocean with the evident support of the ISA. Without further delay, I, I will now introduce our first speaker for today, um, Mariama Williams. Mariama is a feminist economist with over 20 years ex working experience on economic development, macroeconomics, trade, external debt, and finance issues with a focus on gender equality and women's empowerment, social equity, sustainable finance, and development and climate change issues. She is the director of the Institute of Law and Economics in Jamaica and a member of the Caribbean Feminist Action Network, the Gender and Trade Coalition, and a principal consultant with Integrated Policy Research Institute. Mariama is the author of a number of publications and is currently a senior associate with the Political Ecology and Sustainability Program of Dawn. Greetings, Mariama. Thank you for joining us. Yes. Greetings, everyone. Greetings. Good morning, good evening, good night to everyone. This is a global panel, and I know people are up late. Some are up early. For me, it's just about twilight hours, so I'm in good stead. Um, so it's about an hour from my bedtime, <laughs> my normal bedtime. I'm an early morning riser. So um, thank you so much. This is a, an amazing panel. First, I must put a disclaimer that I'm not in any way an expert on the topic. I come to this. I bring my perspective from 20 years of following trade negotiations, 10 to 15 years of climate negotiations, and a whole host of things, which has um, unfortunately left me very cynical and very sad as I sat here today reading about the deep sea mining, because I can see the parallels for climate change, which we have been negotiating since 1992. And despite supposedly a global um, support for it, we haven't been able to solve that issue and it's getting worse and worse every day. So I don't have, I don't come with a very optimistic heart about the deep sea mining. When I realize the extent, the extent of the money that has been put into the technology of it. And I just read a recent paper that came out financed by the mental company, a Yale University study that's like halfway here, halfway there, it may do this, but it will be great, but it may do this it kind of hedging. And then at the end of the study, I saw it was financed by the, the mineral company. I said, okay, now I understand. Uh, so the, the, the oil has been greased for really getting a decision out of the ISA that will allow this unless somehow we can really marshal the world really fully to understand the serious danger, catastrophic danger of this approach. And it's really saddens me to think that many of our developing countries who have been fighting in climate change and talking about development versus survival and accusing other countries of choosing development versus their survival are the ones leading the charge for deep sea mining, which has such catastrophic impact, not just for the region, but for climate change, right? As I read and I studied and I looked at it. So I have three or four things to say. One is that the ocean, our ocean, it's not this narrative of this vast remote ocean out there um, with you know, non-human life that we don't need to be concerned about, but has all these resources that will be will lead us to green land, uh, to green them. So I wanna say that the ocean is very, very important. It's up 60 to 70%, depending on who you look at, who you look at of the ocean, of the earth's surface. It is home to tremendous amount of um, phytoplankton, microbes, microbes for health. They found now that tremendous amount of the, um, I saw one scientist say that we don't know we know point not, not, not about life under sea. We know more about what's up in Mars than we do. And yet we are getting ready to dig 3000 meters down into the earth and then to, to bring this up and then backflow it back in um, without any consideration for what it might be. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the political economy behind this. I have a few words about the governance structure and I, I want to start out by talking about the, the framing of this 
panel. And I really thank Don for framing this panel about equality, empowerment, greenwashing, blue washing, development washing, because it's all of that and more. Um, mm -hmm. I think the equality dimension is what I want to talk about first. And it's not certainly gender equality and the uh, rights of indigenous people and coastal citizens are very par prominent and paramount. But from, from my perspective, as following negotiation many, many years, I look at the ISA and they talk about the equality of all nations. And that's a sham. That is, that is not possible when 45 million square kilometers of the ocean is already controlled by developed countries and their territories, when they control the technology, the knowledge and the financing, and when all of our governments are being advised by external advisors who come for, and, and in particular from the finance sector, who are given advice about planning. So planning is back. That's the other thing I want to say. It, it's clear to me from reading literature that planning is back. It's planning the ocean. Our economies are being planned around the ocean and in a way that to service international capital and driven by the financial markets. So I think we, 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 we need to look at the discourse and the narrative around that. Uh, there's a lot of, and then the other thing I want to flag, I have lots to say, but I know that we don't have enough time, so I'm just going to flag a few of what I call, as I was looking at the literature, I talked about the myths and mysticism around this. And one of the big myths is that we must harvest what's in the ocean floor for sustainability. It will be more sustainable, sustainable for us than what we do on land. And I ask myself, sustainable for who and for and why? So we have to negotiate, we have to question this whole idea of the scope, the nature and the purpose of deep sea mining. Um, um, what, what if when you industrialize the ocean, which is what we are doing, we are not greening, we are not talking about sustainability for climate, we're not talking about green economy, we're talking about industrializing the ocean for profit. And anytime you look at all of it, it's a seabed extraction, right? It's not a sustainability issue. And with technology that's been spent, it's not going to be beneficial to us. And in fact, the area that's most likely to be to be this to go on is the Eastern Pacific, which means that again, it's the resources of developing countries and who will have the negative adverse, who will get the benefit, right? If we take terrestrial mining, right? I come from Jamaica where we have aluminum. None of our communities that live in aluminum areas have grown rich and benefited. In fact, they're left with gaping holes that fills up in the flood, washing away their homes. So I cannot, in any good consciousness, think that a mining company, these are mining companies, technology and all the fancy stuff, they're mining companies, right? That a mining company or any set of mining company, including their financiers, will have the heart and the mind and the rights and the equality and the living standards of the people who will be impacted by this, right? So I think the idea that we need, we must do it because we want to have, if we have, want to have a carbon free or a carbon neutral world, we must dig up the ocean. I think that's a false narrative. It's a false discourse. I think they're also alternative to some of the nickel and cobalt that they're saying that they must, they will need for these cars. Who are these cars for? Who dominate these, the driving and the utilization of these cars? Is it our people in the developing countries? Are they the one who will be affected by the backdrop of digging up the ocean and then piping back dirt into the ocean that you cannot control, which you filter back through the water columns into community inundated shores? I mean, I, I, I am just, I'm sorry, I'm just, it's just amazing to me that our developing countries, after having negotiated climate change for so long and seeing all the manipulation that went on, can still be fooled or be taken on board by this idea that somehow we're going to develop out of this. We have not benefited from the extraction of, look at any country that have extracted resources in the developing country and see where that has gotten us. So uh, there's a nice paper I want to refer to because I won't have time to refer to it, to read through it. I wanted to go through it um, by Carver et al. 2020 in Oceans Magazine. And they looked at the political economy of deep sea mining. 
And they argue that there's a narrative. They look at the discourse and the practices around deep sea mining. The narrative, of course, that it's, it's for sustainability, the narrative of development dim um, dimension, and ask who are, what are the drivers behind deep sea mining? It are, it's a finances, financials, financiers who are supporting the state in defining the new mandate, in defining the planning and defining the space. And they basically argue that we need to have more widespread discussion around the tensions, that the ocean is not out there. Deep sea mining is just not about the ocean, but deep sea mining actually impacts the coastal community, it impacts cultural rights, it impacts domestic rights, it impacts sovereignty. So we need to really unpack the political economy of this in terms of the discourse and the practices around deep sea mining. Thank you very much, Mariama, for really kicking off and helping us punch the, the air above us with everything you've just said, great energy. And thank you for highlighting some of the really, really key and worrying concerns that we're carrying here as we, we challenge this um, false narrative of the benefits of deep sea mining. I look forward to you know, more discussions and uh, your views in the Q&A that you can expand on in terms of um, yeah, the importance of oceans, the issue of governance and the framing of equality. Thank you so much, Mariama. Um, I take this opportunity now to introduce our second speaker, um, the Honorable Debbie Inarewapaka. Um, Honorable Debbie is a member of the Parliament of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and a co-leader of the Maori Party, and uh, Kiara Taki of Ngati Ruanui. My apologies, Honorable Debbie, if I'm pronouncing this incorrectly. Um, for two decades, she has been a strong advocate for uh, Maori health and the environment in Te Tai Hauru. She is a committed kai tiaki fighting to protect the environment, specifically leading the campaign to stop seabed mining off the Tai Hawaru coast, confronting many adversaries and personal sacrifices. The Honorable Debbie has fought against iron sand mine, mining off the Taranaki coast and mobilized hundreds of Taranaki people in 2004 to join the foreshore and seabed protest. In March 2021, she announced the Te Pati Maori first member bill on the prohibition of seabed mining legislation amendment bill. Her legislation bill comes after six years of leading a fight against Trans Tasman Resource Limited, a company seeking to mine the South Taranaki coast seabed. Kia ora, Honorable Debbie, and welcome. Kia ora, tōtei ngā mihi kia koutou koe tai mai, and um, my um, greetings and aroha to everyone that's here. I think like the last speaker, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. And um, I am conscious, sorry, that not long after this, I have to be um, in the House um, in Parliament sitting in about 20 minutes. So my apologies if I'm not here through the whole um, webcam. And so I'm going to get um, stuck into it. I guess um, from our perspective, and I totally took all the cordial and the passion of uh, Maureen of the Wahine, oh, not of... Um, bigger pardon of uh, Miriam before me, is that um, this is nothing other than environmental vandalism. This is There is no other way to describe what seabed mining is um, proposing to do. And I think if we can all come from the perspective that uh, as an Indigenous persons, we have indeed a um, an obligation, a DNA responsibility to protect for future generations. And if we were to talk about what drives us as wahine, uh, it is not uh, legacy, fame, ego, profits. It's actually real simple, simple things as a wahine, which is to ensure that my mokopuna grandchildren um, get to have a planet that's intact for them to be able to be well, to be well culturally, to be well environmentally. And uh, we have a kwakaro, which I'm sure a lot of other Indigenous whānau do, which is, you know, most of our body is made up of, of water. Uh, the semen that, um, that goes to the wahine is, is fluid. When we're carried in our mother's womb, it's fluid. Uh, so our connection to tangaroa, to the ocean, to everything around the ocean is inherent in our wakapapa. So when we rock our babies and there's a rhythm that we have in our puku, in our stomach when we're carrying, 
That is the rhythm that comes from tangaroa and the sea. So to disconnect and to desecrate our environment, specifically around our ocean and our our uh, our, our seabed mining, our, our seabed, sorry, is to actually desecrate our ability as wahine to be able to nurture our future generations. So it is real, um, it's intrinsic in us culturally uh, to fight to stop the vandalism and the desecration of anything that's connected to us um, through years of, of who we are as Indigenous peoples. The other thing is in Aotearoa, we have a tiriti which I don't know um, if everyone else can relate to that, but basically it grants us our rights as the tangata whenua, the indigenous peoples of Aotearoa to protect our rights and interests, to protect our ability to be kaitiaki. So um, we've had real failings in our country to be able to do that. And as a consequence, um, we, you know, we've been to three, four courts now that have found that the government agencies that are meant to protect our environment have failed, not once, um, again, like I said, the High Court, the Supreme Court, um, the Court of Appeal um, and the other order have all ruled in favour for us that uh, the those who are responsible to protect our seabed um, haven't. As a consequence, as wahine, um, we were put into three or four, I guess, activities. So the first for us to do intrinsically to protect our cultural being and our ability to breathe and to um, breed and to be able to live um, is our activism. So, and it's not by chance, I was, as I was preparing for this speech, it's really interesting. Our lawyer, our frontline activists, our um, political, and indeed a lot of our culture were all led by wahine. Now that wasn't necessarily planned, but, um, you know, go figure that we're the ones that will turn up, you know, uh, and again, uh, you know, again, in support of our Tani, but when I look at it, I was sort of having a bit of a giggle to myself, by no means of predetermining, but every part of our um, fight against this was driven by wahine and the values that we have. The ultimate goal is that we have to preserve this for our future generations. There was no other agenda. So I don't want to make it look like that we were rocket scientists, or that we were strategically clever um, with a whole lot of um, research and academia, we weren't, we were driven by pure, um, you know, the, the the drum, the beat of the drum within our soul. And um, that continues to be it. And I guess the lessons as wahine that we learned is that when the, um, when the beat of the drum to preserve our future came out, it was amazing who turned up. And we had, uh, and so there was uh, probably there were thousands in total but from those who were planning, those who were engaged in preparing legal cases, those who were engaged in lobbying um, politicians, which, by the way, failed us, which is why you now see me in politics, um, that they um, were driven by, we were, had, we were, let me take a step back, we had a whole lot of volunteers. We were fed by volunteers. We mobilised um, as volunteers. We had our um, iwi, our tribal people that backed us as much as they could, but effectively the mobilisation and the energy that went into this was very much um, voluntary. And I think it was that passion that absolutely made sure there's no way we we're going to give this up or we're going to lose. Because you know the social licence that these, these seabed miners, who by the way were all men, that come out and make promises to, you know, we will help and and if I give a bit of context, I come from a region that is quite um, economically struggles. Uh, we've had high redundancies. We were driven by a lot of freezing works and factories. And so um, we're a lot uh, lower in our capacity and ability to earn than other regions. So when someone turns up and says, I can give you more jobs, I promise there'll be jobs for the cleaners, there'll be jobs for the cooks, there'll be jobs for the motels and so there was a real um, rise to that call. And we had to really spend a lot of time to dig down and sort of say, well, they're not going to give 1,400 jobs. They're not going to give you know, 700 jobs. In fact, they're not going to give 100 jobs. They're specialised positions, which none of us has. They're going to fly talent in. They're going to use facilities in the big cities. They are not going to bring 
um, the promises of gold and prosperity that they were. But you spend a lot of time counteracting that argument because when you're a desperate community, you know, you've really got to justify why you're um, turning away perhaps the only opportunity that your area is going to have for a long time. So there was a lot of that. Uh, and, and I guess the biggest part that I would to sort of say about um, how we had to talk to each other was actually to make sure that the conversations and the debates and the um, misinformation was counteracted and we spent as much time talking to ourselves about that. Because the last thing you need when you're up against these big kahunas is division. And that's the first thing they attempt to do. They went in and they romanced our local government. They had support from our central government. All the business communities, you know, who have louder voices and bigger pockets to market that message um, were on it. They were all at it. And it was only as we started winning cases in court that they started to think, oh, whoa, you know, maybe those Maoris have got something. Maybe that radical woman's got a little bit of sense to what she's saying. But it took a long time for the group think of um, those that thrive off capitalism to actually drop off. In the end, we had, for example, our local mayor, who is really against us and really supportive of it, totally against it. In the end, we had politicians um, in opposition who were really for it, we started to see the facts and we and went against it and supported us. But it really took a lot of stamina to get to that stage. And so I want to um, acknowledge all those grassroots fighters because, like I said, that was really the activity that we had to do, which was the passion of the divers that knew the state of um, our reefs when these big companies were saying, oh, they're barren, there's nothing there. And we're like, oh, yeah, no, no, you're so wrong. And they'd go out and put cameras in the ocean and they were – getting all the, um, and I guess that was the other thing is that we were working with people we probably haven't worked with for a long time. So, you know, you've got to embrace that and you've got to really encourage that, um, that you're not being um, driven by, you know, I have to be the only one driving this. You've got to have multiple um, angles, I guess, in my experience and our experience of sharing the leadership. Now, that's really, that's really different, especially an Indigenous woman, because we don't trust, well, I can only speak for myself, but we don't trust particularly well. I um, mean, if you haven't lived with us for a thousand years, we really don't trust you at all. But anyway, I can only talk from my final experience. So I think um, there was a lot of that. There was a lot of promises, a lot of promises. And uh, it took real um, grind and guts to um, counteract that and stay together. I think um, some of the questions, and I really like how you've initiated them, where you're asking um, how we critique the actual benefits that were being promised. Uh, there was a, a couple of ways, again, I think because we had a collective tribal um, entity, we were able to you know, use some of their experts to assess some of the um, economic benefits. But the reality is, there, you know, when you look at the size and the scale, and they were looking to, um, I think it was a 60 square kilometre space, looking to do 50 million tonnes, um, extraction. When you look at the size of the equipment and you look at, uh, you know, you're not just going to be able to dive in and be a swimmer. You ha you actually have to be extremely skilled and qualified. So we just kept um, busting them for the alternative facts. And we got sponsored by different ones who would help with our um, newspaper campaigns, our social media campaigns. And every time we got new info, we just had a network. And there's nothing like a woman's network. Um, of being able to spread that around. And of course, you know, we we are run largely by a lot of very strong, stroppy aunties. Um, I mean, they scare the, the, the hell out of us. So the minute they tell their kids and everyone else to spread it, this is actually how we um, counteract it again. So nothing particularly sophisticated. It was um, really just about us, again, combining the activism, um, the legal and the political. It got to a point in the last court case when we thought, well, this is it, yay. And then they took us um, back to court again. And by that stage, we decided that because none of our large parties in government were going to bat for us, even though there'd been promises made before they got elected, um, we decided that we needed to push um, stronger in the political space and once and for all get this stopped through legislation. So Part of my being in there, other than addressing equality and equity, was being able to 
use that platform to um, put my first members bill together, which is to prohibit this activity once and for all. Uh, we've had support from the Greens Party. Um, the National Party, I don't, which is one of ours, we don't expect they're going to um, jump on board. They're a very profit-focused party. Um, and Labour so far have been quiet. So, uh, and we also ran a petition with that. And I guess one other thing I sort of will drop on, um, hoping that I've hit what you wanted to hear today. And if I haven't, that's okay. You can question the email me anytime. But the other thing that we did from our experience was we had multiple allies, multiple allies, including yourselves. So we reached out to our sisterhood, our brotherhood, our um, indigenous hood, our other environmentalists, um, and we were able to work with Greenpeace on some of the petition activity. And um, yeah, that's, that's where it sits, is that I think one of the things that if I was to ever share is that we never give up. Um, behind me, I have two daughters and then a granddaughter. Um, ahead of me, I have these aunties with hundreds of nieces. And we just will not give up on letting anyone um, desecrate or deliberately vandalise our environment while you know, expecting us to sit back and watch. So if it means that I'm uncomfortably in places in Parliament, which I probably never expected to be in, um, you know, have to be doing different things, then that's the degree of commitment that we have to stop this. And um, our mihi and our aroha to all of you that are experiencing the same battle. Koira. Thank you so very much, Honourable Debbie. That is excellent. And yes, you have spoken to and, and shared so much um, and added to the conversation um, on this challenge and you know, critiquing the, the benefits um, and the framing of this equality. Um, it's really admirable, um, the journey and the, the fight that you have led and been part of. Um, and I really, really appreciate the, you know, the charge for the environmental vandalism that we're all facing and we're all taking up this, this fight together. And um, it's been really great to see how, the, how you and your party have taken the political and legal steps forward and learning from those lessons as well and looking for opportunities to do the same within our own communities and countries. Thank you, Honorable Debbie. Um, with that, I now jump to the third speaker um, and I'll introduce uh, Pele Natita, Tara from uh, the Kingdom of Tonga. Um, Tita is the project coordinator for the Civil Society Forum of Tonga and is working on the campaign against deep sea mining. Um, she has been working in the space since 2012 um, and has been involved in the national campaign for a moratorium against deep sea mining and seabed mining in Tonga. Uh, she's represented the civil society's position in various local and regional meetings and has been working with communities to lobby for support of a total ban on deep sea mining since November 2020. Tita is very passionate about saving the ocean like many of us and saying that not only as part of our collective responsibilities towards sustaining scarce resources, but also because it is the source of livelihood for over 90% of the people of Tonga. Tita says, we and the rest of the world are connected by the ocean. So if the ocean suffers, we suffer too. Malolele Tita and welcome. Sorry. Malolele, uh, Mariam, and hello to everyone. Um, I have to stop the tears flowing because the two past speakers have literally taken the words out of my mouth. So I am not going to repeat the whole eco um, angle because Miriam has done an excellent job, um, as well as covering some of the uh, community aspect. Honorable Debbie has done a brilliant job of ex explaining it. And I think that's the commonality that we have across the Pacific, you know, um, that we feel it's not about the science. It's never about the, um, the money. This is about our livelihood. This is about our land, our ocean, and you know the the products that we'll leave behind, and the environment we'll left behind for a generation or come. Um, I've got four girls, you know. Uh, someday they will say to their own kids, "This is what I passed through," and I think that's the kind of a feeling that we have. It get me really emotional because. It angers me at the same time, like um, Miriam said, you know, I don't feel good about this. This is 
how broken for me to actually feel that we actually legalized the vandalism of our own ocean, you know, the very basic livelihood. We actually legalize it and people are not actually standing up to fight for it. And, you know, I'm so grateful that this multi-stakeholders approach that we have across the world um, have actually reached out and joined the fight that we have been having on the ground for a generation that has passed. Tonga uh, has about 90% coastal communities, as well as depending on their livelihood um, in the ocean. 82% of women, you know, who are house, household led, uh, this is around nearly 20,000 um, um, families, who are actually depending on the sea. Um, 82% of these women who actually fish are actually just for consumption for their families. Only 70% of these are actually sold in the market. So there is so much cabs in the data collection and disaggregation of data that related to women in Tonga. That's because like, we don't stand out there and sell so we can be recorded you know, and be documented. Um, a GDB, um, fishery contribute roughly around 12%. Um, so in a sense, we are not actually um, selling our fish, even though we have the resources. So there are two things that I'm looking at is like a lot of our fish are being um, stolen by, you know, foreign fisheries because we don't have uh, enough resources to, you know, to police our, our space. Um, as well as a lot of our fish actually are for consumption, you know, that's why it, this is so important. This is like that, you know, that whole um, court that connects the baby to the womb. If you cut that, if you actually legalize this vandalism, we're actually cutting that court. And this example is during the Huma, you know, everyone in probably half of the world knew about that eruption and the impact it has on the ocean because there was a declaration, no fishing until they can confirm that the resources is not contaminated because of the amount of dust that have been blown out um, during the eruption. We heard of people, you know, stealing to the ocean, you know, um, taking fish behind um, the regulators back because you know, where else they can turn to? It's either your land or your sea. So these are very real for us. And it's so, um, you know, okay. Talking about this um, total mining company, uh, formerly known as Deep Green, and they have their local affiliates, the Domo. They have been campaigning uh, since 2008 when they first had their license. We didn't have our law until 2014. They were already on the ground circulating the ideas and start putting little pockets of funding here and there for the communities. You know, Honorable Dabby has fully explained that whole process of you making the decision for your small community group, you know, saying no to 20,000 torn per anga that will make a difference in putting, you know, a public toilet or a community tank for your community. Tough choice. And, you know, and people can look at the ocean as like, you know, it will still be there tomorrow. I have to make that decision today. It made the difference. But the whole greenwashing of, you know, this is what we do. We help the economy. We support women. And majority of these community groups are actually women with young girls. So those assistants, you know, there are times when I actually up there in, um, in public and talking about, you know, saying no to it, you know, having an ethical stand that make you say no to the assistant from Donald because that money is actually blood money, you know. But would I come over with that 20 grand and make sure they have a community tank? Would I be there to actually put public toilet? So these are the tough goals that communities have and which I'm battling with when you're actually out there talking to the community and helping them to make a decision. You talk about um, ISA, 
you know, putting up this publication that 54% of all the people they employ are women. 54, uh, 44% of all their trainees are girls, you know, supporting the, the uh, female scientists. But the real question is, what kind of job do they hold? You know, there's a different debate on the amount of, um, of uh, percentage that have been encouraged by the mining company when they employ women. So it ranged from 5% to 17%, depending on which literature um, you actually read. But um, the sad thing about it is like the whole retention year is basically 10. And that's actually an increase in the first five years from 5%. The kind of average year that a female work in any kind of mining um, uh, platform is, you know, 40 years. So we are integration into the whole mining company. So you're looking at domination of men. So within the ISA, you know, out of the 163, the little bit of uh, participation are actually from the Pacific who become members with the big lion, you know, giant companies behind them, funding and fronting them to actually be the mouthpiece. The perfect example is now triggering the two years um, um, rules. You know, you're put at a hard place, you know, between the rock and the stone, what is your choice when it does make a difference? And, you know, our king opened the parliament this year and supporting the utilization of our minerals um, for economic benefit. So um, my own interpretation is, is that a royal approval for deep sea mining to proceed? So again, it's back to, this is our only livelihood. But, you know, Miriam has mentioned about whose benefit are we striving so hard to actually promote? Has there ever been any mining um, um, island or nations that have left with the promised rich that has been advocated at the beginning? No. At the beginning, they thought that Tonga might end up having hosting a plant where you have hundreds of jobs. Common sense wise, Tonga is too small. That kind of a plant they expected to build need a miter in bigger land that we have, you know, right next to uh, the sea, we're what, five meters? Highest point is six to seven um, feet above the ground. So you're going to build a plant there? But people would want it to hear what they wanted to hear. And, you know, these profiteers are so smart. They have crafted um, the narrative, um, beautifying this industry to be the saving Christ for humankind. I don't think so, right? So, and the fact that ISA is actually, you know, pushing for this because it's the panacea for climate um, crisis, it's a whole fabrication. The whole discourse that Miriam talk about, you know, and the literature is littered with it, but of course they will not quote it. They will just retain on what they think um, will benefit their um, propaganda, right? So um, the common um, concern in Tonga is like, how can the government do this? You know, how can we survive if this happened? You know, the Honga example is one perfect example. Going with our fish nearly two months before they actually say that it's okay to start consuming. And that's just one, you know, eruption. You're looking at, you know, multiple machineries, how many tons out there, you know, generating bloom that will basically suffocate our um, ecosystem. So, yes, um, that's something I don't think we should legalize. And I thank everyone for helping me do my job and help stop this gigantic um, monster, uh, Total Mining Company, from proceeding next year. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tita, for sharing um, what it's like on the ground there in Tonga. Um, you know, the, the place, the tough place that communities are faced 
um, you know, between a rock and a hard place, um, having to you know, reconcile the offer of you know, these riches from the mining companies and then what's right in front of them. There's real risks to the environment. 90% um, of the community is coastal. Um, and yes, just that example and demonstration that you shared about the eruption and, you know, that, you know, even though, the, though this is not fish until it's safe to fish, um, but the reality is, you know, coastal communities, that's their source of food, so they're every day there. Um, imagine, just imagine when the mining companies come in, you know, the, what, what does that mean for the food source and the livelihoods and the realities of Pacific Islanders? Thank you, Tita, and we look forward to um, more exchanges and more views um, in the question and answer time, um, especially on um, you know, the ISA um, and your, your charge and um, their framing um, and their push in, within the region. Thank you. With that, um, I'll go to the uh, fourth speaker um, and introduce Uta, our fourth speaker. Um, Uta is uh, from Berlin and is a political scientist working on integrated ocean governance with a focus on the institutional dimensions, environment and rights of marginalized groups, um, and a just transformation towards a peaceful human relationship uh, with the ocean. She studied feminist theory and practice and international environmental regimes, and did research on the role of locally controlled and governance systems in promoting or hindering collective action in favor of the conservation and sustainable use of uh, coral reef resources. In response to the ocean climate biodiversity emergency currently before us, Uta has been following UN processes uh, related to the SDG 14, UNFCCC, the ISA, BBNJ, and CBD in collaboration with feminist networks and other CSOs. Greetings, Uta. Good morning to you. Good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon to everyone who's there we are following. It's very uh, hard to keep up with, with uh, so many uh, great women here in this panel. And um, yeah, I uh, try to uh, take you with me to the international level. And um, yeah, I started uh, from the report of the um, ISA released in uh, 2021, um, uh, titled The Contribution of the ISA to the Achievements of the uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable uh, Development. And uh, it's a statement um, that uh, the ISA is contributing to uh, gender equality and empowerment of women. And um, the examples in this report um, are particularly uh, enhancing women in marine scientific research, especially women from developing countries and uh, also in uh, research um, companies. And um, so, uh, yeah, so, so this uh, might be the case that uh, the, the ISA is active, uh, actively contributing to, to uh, enhancing the number of women in uh, these um, uh, research uh, networks. But uh, from our point of view, I think it is important to ask uh, what are the objectives of these research? Um, what is the outcome? What are the underlying values? And um, does the outcome, does this research um, enhance our understanding um, um, of how to destroy the ocean with uh, seabed mining technologies, with destructive technologies, or um, does it enhance our understanding how to protect and sustainably use the ocean for uh, the benefit of present and future generations and for their right to a healthy planet and also for the right of marine um, biodiversity and marine life to exist and to maintain their vital circles. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, I must not answer this question. I think uh, the previous panelists have, have made it clear that we, um, we know uh, what the answer is. So uh, from our point of view, from the, from the um, point of view, from the, 
I'm working with, we do not only focus on, on science and the enhancement uh, of uh, women and empowerment of women in science. And of course, uh, science that contributes to uh, sustainable outcomes and uh, to a just transformation of what's needed in regard to um, the ocean climate biodiversity emergency. And, uh, but we also need to take into account uh, the knowledge of women, other non-scientific knowledge of women, um, including uh, traditional knowledge, and especially uh, taking into account the role of women and their knowledge in this regard. And uh, so here, uh, we are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of work ahead and uh, a lot of um, needs to be done to enhance the awareness and the understanding of the need of women and uh, their knowledge and the role of, uh, uh, and their right to engage in, uh, as, as critical agents of change in these emergencies. So uh, next, I uh, would like to, address the gender equality, um, empowerment and participation of women in ocean governance. And as my previous speaker um, already pointed to, uh, the ISA in this regard is not really um, very uh, uh, much contributing to um, SDG 5. And uh, there is a lack of uh, women. We want, um, let's say, um, it's important that women not only um, can, can enter more spaces in science and in research, but also in uh, ocean governance uh, spheres that is um, related from planning to decision-making, implementation and review. And um, at all levels, from local to global and within each level at uh, all decision-making uh, spaces. And uh, so let's, uh, not only share some, some uh, the knowledge, but also the power. Uh, let's change the imbalance of power in ocean governance. And um, in this regard, uh, yes, the ISA has a great deficit. It is not open, it is not transparent, and a lack of women voices in these uh, bodies and processes is, uh, um, yeah, is obvious. And uh, so, uh, yeah, this is, an instrumentalization of, of um, emancipatory language we do not accept. The sad thing is that um, the ISA and uh, within UNCLOS, the ISA is dominating uh, or, or making visible a discourse on gender equality and empowerment of women that is lacking uh, under the BBNJ uh, negotiations so far. And uh, so on the one hand, an agency and, uh, that is promoting a destructive technology and uh, some, uh, with a uh, disastrous impact on the marine environment, the, the marine biodiversity is uh, carrying a discourse on uh, gender equality and women empowerment. And um, on the other side, um, a process that is that aims at protecting and um, sustainably using and preserving the biodiversity is lacking of a visibility of women, their rights, and their role in these um, processes. So uh, there is an imbalance we really have to correct. And this uh, panel is a very good start in this direction. So. Um, then in the report of uh, 2021, the ISA states that it uh, contributes um, to uh, decarbonization and with it to SDG 13, combating climate change. And of course, this is not true. Mining will release carbon and thus accelerating climate change. Moreover, Climate change impacts already the deep sea, also in depth of relevance of mining. And this is not recognized. I uh, point to the um, just released um, Working Group 2 report to, uh, of the IPCC 
uh, which uh, contributes to our um, uh, six and also to the SROC that was released in uh, the special report, the IPCC special report on ocean and climate change um, of uh, 2019. Um, both cover, uh, include um, information on uh, the deep sea and climate change in the deep sea. And um, so we can see in the deep sea uh, that all impacts of climate change or most of the impacts of climate change on the ocean are already um, uh, affect the deep sea and especially warming, also uh, acidification, de um, deoxygenation. And uh, these are direct uh, impacts in the deep sea stratification of surface water together with processes at uh, the surface also play a significant role um, or also uh, indirectly. So uh, the problem is that we do not have a uh, robust observation uh, and uh, of these impacts and uh, COVID-19 delayed uh, a number of cruises and uh, delayed information in this regard and uh, this is the research we need, the impacts on climate change. And I uh, refer to the um, new uh, report and pointing to uh, that at all warming um, in the deep ocean, all global warming levels will cause faster movements of temperature niches by uh, 2100 uh, than those that have driven extensive reorganization of marine biodiversity at the ocean surface over the last 50 years. And um, what is also, um, there, there are, I, I, it's, uh, I would like to highlight that uh, the special, uh, the summary of policymakers and the uh, technical report do not um, contain much information uh, directly to the deep sea, but um, this is more in, in chapter three to, uh, of the full report. Um, but however, um, uh, the findings of the uh, summary for policymakers applied uh, uh, to the deep sea as well. And uh, what is to be uh, taken into consideration is that um, the uh, risks um, in the deep sea are, um, and, and the um, because a warming acidification and will continue for decades. What's, what's happening now will affect the deep sea uh, later for decades. It, it arrives there uh, much later. So, um, and the warming in the deep sea accelerates much, much more than the warming at the surface. And this has to be taken into account. And this is very important when we talk about risk reduction and um, impact assessment and so on. And um, this is, let, now let's ask, how does the ISA take these findings into account? How is this considered in their impact assessment when they uh, decide on mining? And uh, here we have a great, great gap. Um, let's start with biodiversity. Biodiversity, the CBD defines biodiversity, uh, distinguishes species biodiversity, ecosystem biodiversity, and genetic biodiversity. And um, what is considered in uh, uh, mining impact assessments is mostly some uh, species and not the other aspects. And uh, many species are unknown. So how will the impact on these species uh, be uh, evaluated? This is completely unclear. And um, then climate change, warming and so on. This is not recognized yet. And uh, therefore, if we stop mining, if we, if we ban mining from the deep sea, this is risk reduction impact reduction, climate responsive policy. This is a contribution to combat climate change. And uh, stopping banning seabed mining from going ahead is a contribution to com combat mine, uh, um, climate change, 
to stop biodiversity loss and to stop ocean degradation. And my final, I see I'm running out of time, probably. <laughs> I see you're getting me nervous, Mary. Okay, but I have a, a fourth point, and I will be very brief on this, but uh, this is something for the discussion uh, as well. We are very few women at the international level fighting in, the, in so many spaces that are currently taking place at the same time, and we are very tired. And it is so important. Uh, first of all, I hope more will join, but however, I really value and appreciate the exchange with, with women and with networks uh, who are fighting this on the ground. And uh, this, um, the commitment is impressive. It gives also strength to us at the international level in these spaces to uh, continue. And this exchange is so important. And um, we need it in the future. And uh, I would like to hear your views and uh, on how we can institutionalize this a little bit better. And because, uh, yes, uh, I'm sad to say it, but um, let's face it, I think uh, we will not stop fighting DSM to, uh, today or tomorrow. We will yeah. do it a little bit later, probably. However, uh, we are. I'm looking forward to your ideas and thank you very much for having uh, me invited and for letting me listen to so many impressive uh, people and uh, I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Uta, for uh, your presentation, for highlighting also and speaking directly to the ocean climate nexus that is, uh, you know, that gets left out when we're um, the proponents for supporting uh, deep sea mining uh, seem to um, take a different take on uh, the benefits of DSM for climate change response. But um, you know, putting the biodiversity loss front and center there, and um, you know, as the impacts deep sea, it cannot be um, hidden. It's uh, an important point. Thank you very much for that, and highlighting also the contradictions. Within the current ISA's many uh, tracks of what they're promoting in the different ocean spaces at the international level and their priorities. And, um, and also, um, you know, just speak to the solidarity of the women's movement, grassroots all the way to the global spaces um, up there at the UN and uh, New York and Geneva. And, and definitely echo your, your sentiments about continuing to stay connected and to support each other, uh, Uta. Um, as we are about to uh, go into our final present, our final speaker for the day, um, I'd just like to reiterate um, for those of you who are um, interested to ask questions to the panelists as we go into Q&A after the final speaker, um, please post your questions in the box. We have a couple coming through in the chat box. If I can ask you to move your questions to the Q&A box that's there. Um, and then, um, yeah, let's kick start with the final speaker of today, and it's um, our co-host here, uh, Maureen Petuelli, um, as our fourth speaker. Um, and she, Mar Maureen, has over 20 years of experience in nonprofit sector, working mainly in the field of environment, economic, political, and social justice uh, in the Pacific region. She's the current coordinator of the Pacific Network on Globalization, Pang, our co-host for the webinar today, and is uh, also one of the initiators of the Pacific Blue Line uh, campaign, a collective campaign calling for a global ban on deep sea mining. Maureen, Bulavinaka and greetings. Thank you for joining us today. Um, the floor is yours. Nisan Bulavinaka and warm greetings to everyone. Um, Given the time constraints, I'm just going to jump into it. And as the last speaker, I am just going to kind of emphasize where emphasis is needed. And I want to just really start with where Uta left off, really to understand ISA's uh, interpretation of what it means when it says it's advancing women's empowerment and leadership. Um, and it, it has this two three flag flagship projects um, to measure women's empowerment and leadership. And that first one has to do with uh, gender parity at the Secretariat itself. 
Um, so on gender parity at the ISA, which is located in Jamaica, it's achieved a 54% of staff who are women. I don't know what that means in terms of seniority of staff, but that's the, the kinds of uh, data sets that's coming from the ISA. On the uh, other two flagship projects, one is, I think, Mar Mariama touched on it and Peter also touched on it. But it's really targeting LDCs, uh, least developed countries, landlocked countries, women in particular around scientific research. And I think Uta touched a bit on this. Uh, to date, um, 500 individuals from developing countries have benefited including 44% of women. So that's, that's really less than 250 women in total in that flagship program that ISA is running. The final one is really looking at contractors training program. So there are currently 31 contracts um, in the high seas. And there's a pledge to reserve uh, half of their training opportunities for women wherever possible. So seven out of those 31. And that's the ISA's real claim and flagship around women's economic empowerment and leadership. So I want to then step back and look at some of the real structural barriers that we are facing, particularly from a Pacific context in two ways. Um, we are at the forefront of deep sea mining because our, within our national jurisdiction, all of our countries, sovereign countries in the Pacific region have tenements, have issued tenements. We have laws that have really signal that we are the frontier region of the world. Secondly, and in areas beyond national jurisdiction, five of our Pacific Island countries, Nauru, Tonga, Cook Islands, Kiribati, and just last year, Tuvalu, are all sponsoring states. And so here it becomes really complicated because we have to fight on two fronts. Within our jurisdiction, where Tita is doing a phenomenal job in Tonga, trying to slow the kinds of... Um, Pushed by our states. And I think one of the biggest challenges that we have is the capturing of our state's imagination from the very beginning. The fact that deep sea mining is presented as very low risk, sometimes no risk at all or impacts at all, and extremely staggering economic returns have really bought the imaginations of our political elites in our countries. And in many ways, it is why we are at the forefront of deep sea mining, despite, as Mariama really put quite clearly, despite the fact that we are the moral champions and authority on the climate crisis, but we've been bought from the very beginning that this is about economic and economic benefits. So the way our laws have been structured to enable deep sea mining within our jurisdictions have failed structurally from the very beginning on things like consultation. Uh, in many of our jurisdictions, consultations, you get 24 hours, 48 hours a week to respond to government's uh, enabling legislative environment to kickstart. And part of this relates to the fact that government view minerals as belonging to the state, one. Secondly, they view that there are not many people who can make claims, including indigenous communities, uh, let alone civil society. So in the structural barriers of engagement have been designed from the very beginning to limit, and in most cases, keep women out of negotiations at the national level. So from the very beginning, for many of us who have been in this work, we were, we've been up front in front of our technical agencies, in front of our governments, demanding that they do basic consultation processes that are extensive. 
And that's been a long battle. Ten years of engaging to improve this kinds of structural barriers to challenge narratives around benefits come right down to the basics of the fact that we were never at the table from the beginning. Laws were designed. Um, this was presented as something that would take place, not need free prior informed consent of our people. So what you find is that today, within our jurisdictions right across the Pacific, our very own governments do not have free prior informed consent of our people within our jurisdictions, let alone at the ISA. If you overlay the kinds of structural governance problems of the ISA, understanding this from the fact that we've got these five countries who are sponsoring states, they also have not done the basic due diligence process of consultation with our own people. So here we are, um, it, at the global arena being the champions of this with very little understanding. Um, what this really says is that we've disproportionately shifted the debate from contractors, uh, private actors and companies, our very own governments, to women communities, indigenous women and communities to articulate why this is such a bad proposition. From the very beginning, we have had to establish scientifically, legally, economically, morally on why it is such a bad proposition. Um, and so I think this is what the Pacific resistance have been coming up. I wanna really emphasize the basis of um, what Honorable Debbie Parker talks about. Why is it that we've drawn hard lines in the ocean? And this idea that there's a dichotomy that we are against development, against scientific research, that's the argument. When you're at the ISA or when you're meeting with contractors in our very own governments, they frame us as women who oppose science and scientific research, women who oppose development, and women who oppose um, alternative economic pathways for our governments. But we are very clear from the onset on why we've drawn this line, this blue line. To understand benefits, one must really appreciate and understand um, impacts. And really what we, all the evidence within jurisdiction, and again, this is not far out. In the case of Papua New Guinea, tenements are less than 30 kilometers from the nearest communities. That's not far. Um, and those initial anecdotal evidence is very quite clear um, of how bad this is. To what Tito was saying, livelihood options around protein, fish, uh, livelihood, those would be dramatically affected by cultural practices such as shark calling would be implicated and affected by. If we extrapolate impacts um, to, so when you're looking at deep sea mining, you're looking at anything deeper than 200 meters up to 7,000 meters below the sea level. That's quite a huge area of jurisdiction. Um, one of the key things is that responding to these claims, and again, we are in a situation where we are responding to claims by contractors. They've, they've, they've established that nothing lives in the abyssal. We have to demonstrate that in fact, biodiversity, very specific biodiversity and ecosystems thrive in the abyssal. The conditions in which these were formed took millions of years to form. Contracts in the, in the high seas is about 30 years in total. Uh, the scientific evidence now is that we would destroy these systems that took millions of years within these kinds of very small human time scales of 30 years. 
And recovery would not take place within human time scales at all. The idea that you could remediate, protect, or conserve endemic species thrive in these areas. The idea, there's so much in science that we don't understand around just biodiversity, uh, ecosystems, um, both at the substrata level, but also within the water columns. Our governments are not paying attention to how those sediment plumes will spread and affect key uh, economic industries such as fisheries, which is economic lifelines for Pacific Island countries. So when we look at the way that science is coming out at sedimentation plumes uh, within uh, the area where most of the contracts is taking place in under the ISA's guidance, sedimentation plumes from um, could remain suspended in water columns for extensive periods of time. So 300 days could be suspended. It travels slowly um, across and could affect uh, neighboring jurisdictions, if you like. So again, the science is catching up on. And so when you think about 30 years and all of these contractors operating at intensive levels, you begin to appreciate impact. So that challenges this narrative around benefits. The second key thing is around due diligence of our states and liability. This is the one area that our governments in particular do not want to focus on, but they should. We have real experiences, particularly in the case of Papua New Guinea versus Nautilus Inc, Canadian company um, that went bankrupt. In fact, they went for uh, investor state dispute, arbitrated, the PNG government lost, had to pay up $150 million um, and Nautilus directors walked off with tidy little profits. Um, there's a new investor state dispute that's worth mentioning. This is the Texan based Odyssey company that's taken the Mexico government uh, to an investor state dispute with a claim of $3.54 billion. So you can see what's at stake. And I want to come back to the key things that both Mariama and Uta raised around the climate crisis and why we have to draw serious lines. We are from a region where our obligations to protect the life-giving sources of the ocean is quite critical. At a time when the world under the blue economy narrative wants to industrialize all activities on the ocean floor, we have to pay attention to the ocean's role in regulating our climate. It's the longest, most stable carbon sink. The science in terms of understanding how DSM will affect these long-term carbon sinks is still outstanding. How it will affect things like methane seeps is still outstanding. And so I just want to come back to say that from a Pacific perspective, we have long experiences around the kinds of pink washing, development washing, green washing agendas, because we've, and I think the global South, we have this experience to recognize when institutions, uh, transnational corporations frame, we recognize them because we've been here before. This is not new. As Mariama said, we've been here before. We know the language of persuasion. We know the language of articulation that captures our political elite and agency. And the fact that they use women economic empowerment, greenwashing uh, these minerals is in many ways a desperate attempt to make mining palatable. But the more we understand what is at stake and what is at risk, it is why we really invite people to join us. And I think Uta's point, there's so few of us at the multilateral, regional, national level, particularly women at the forefront of this. We need more women, more agency across uh, sectors and movements to join in. 
because what is at risk is something much more fundamental, and that's our planetary life-giving uh, functions of the ocean. That's what is, what's at risk. Thank you, Oni. Thank you, Vinaka Kulebu, uh, Maureen, for those um, you know, the final presentation, but also you know reiterating really important points, um, and you know the the fears that we are all you know looking at deep sea mining at um, through the lenses of and, um, and our concerns and worries as our our states and our political elites are evidently captured by. Um, the sing song and the great deal that's been prompted by the these companies and these uh, big the big countries that are interested in our minerals. Um, this takes us now to the Q and A time. I, I think uh, some of the some of the we've got two questions um, and not a lot of time, so I'm just going to ask both the questions. And I think some of the presentations already have spoken to a couple of these uh, questions, especially uh, Honorable Debbie is no longer with us, but I think she did um, emphasize about the journey her her mobilizing and her um, community have done to resist seabed mining in New Zealand. But um, the first question, and if uh, Tita and Maureen would like to speak to this as well, particularly, and uh, Uta and Mariama might uh, want to add in as well, is from uh, Peggy Entrobus, um, and she's asking um, our Pacific uh, representatives here on the mobilization of Pacific women to resist seabed mining is really impressive. Um, and she's wondering, how did it start? And was there any particular incident or analysis that led to this activism? Uh, maybe Dita Intonga would like to speak to that and share on her experience and whether you have any advice to you know our sisters and colleagues in the Caribbean who are also mobilizing and interested to take this up. Sorry, Dita, your mic is on mute. Okay. Uh, thank you again, uh, Maroni. Um, I think um, this is basically by default that we happen to be more women in the space. But I think from personal experience, um, as indicated before, 82% of these women, you know, fish for survival, you know, for their families, um, for their livelihood. Um, kind of like, you know, a statement on its own. You know, we have more to lose. We are the mothers. You know, we care more um, for the livelihood of our family. We put food on the table. You know, um, when they're hungry, you know, they run to the mothers. And, you know, it's that kind of inbred kind of like um, ethics we were raised with. So anything that we know is a source of livelihood, uh, we defend. Because at the end of the day, if you lose that, you know, ultimately we suffer. And the ocean is one of it. So how this um, evolve, um, when I joined civil society and... Siale was um, the um, executive director and quite passionate about this. There were really uh, only a handful of us. Uh, but I think um, this might be supported by um, a, one of the statements on the literature of the Intergovernmental um, Farm for Metal Minerals Mining for Sustainable Development, as well as uh, McKenzie and Company, and also uh, Australia is an uh, international of, uh, for mining and um, metallurgy um, that say that, you know, that they need gender integration into this industry. Women has been assessed to be more innovative, more um, flexible and more visionaries uh, because of the wider experience, whether that is scientifically driven um, or not, the fact that these three very trustworthy sources have said otherwise, meaning that, you know, women are drawn into this because they are, you know, more visionary, more innovative, and they can see the whole holistic picture rather than the silos where they, you know, kind of box into just making money. So I think this is it. Uh, my advice as, you know, um, as a mother, you know, the ocean and the environment is something worth defending um, for sustainability of this earth. Um, and, you know, there's already many of us there. So um, you speak your heart, people will follow. 
Thank you. Thank you, Tita. Um, uh, Maureen, would you like to share a comment on uh, Pacific mobilizing and what triggered um, us to, to stand up for this? Uh, I think a little bit like what Tita said, I think we were pushed in many ways when we saw like draft legislation uh, being presented um, and, you know, it, it, it kind of gave a green signal. It, there was an assumption that this was simply going to go ahead without any resistance. So we really had to organize ourselves. It's a highly technical area. Um, you need science economists, you need geologists, biologists, um, the skill sets necessary just to deal with the legal nature uh, of green lighting. This uh, was very clear from the beginning. Uh, we've had to build our own knowledge uh, systems and understanding um, within jurisdiction and obviously now extending it. Um, and again, yeah, it's a, but we come from a place where we immediately understood what the proposal threatened, which is very much to do with livelihoods, food security and sovereignty. Um, it would challenge cultural practices. Um, and then, of course, we've learned that it would affect the kinds of climate functions uh, as the science grew. But we knew immediately that this was a very bad proposition for our people from the beginning. Thank you, Maureen. Um, just to, um, we've seen some questions come in, but we're actually almost out of time. And I'm just going to move to ask one more question that has been sitting here. And it's to all the four speakers that we have uh, remaining, and it is looking at the ocean um, climate nexus. And it's asked by Salote Songo, and she's asking, how do these five Pacific countries um, and governments, Nauru, Tuvalu, and Kiribati, et cetera, reconcile their activism for climate change with their sponsorship of deep sea mining? You know, if, um, how would FPIC be effective in changing their sponsorship? Um, and this you know, speaks again to what Mariama challenged us at the beginning of this uh, presentation about that contradiction of um, small island developing states. We were the ones you know, fighting for and the address to climate change on one hand and in the same breath also on another hand, this promoting this destruction and leading and sponsoring this destruction. So if I can uh, you know, pose at the last question and also give uh, each of you a chance to put in some final words um, here as we, we reach the close of our call today and start with um, Mariama, if you'd like to speak first to this um, question on reconciling that contradiction between climate justice and this pro deep sea mining. Hi, so I don't know that I can speak to reconciling it because I'd get myself into a lot of trouble. But I think uh, the two things I want to address, I want to say that we have to be very clear about not buying into this narrative about deep sea mining being part of blue growth or resource frontier, or even what many Pacific Islanders are talking and others even in Africa are limping it in part of national security or security interests. Right? We have to really divorce that. Deep sea mining is not about blue growth. It's not about research frontier or preserving our resource frontier. Um, I think we have to look at the policy, the political ramification of that. And I think that's maybe how a lot of our Pacific brothers and sisters got bought into this. Uh, when you come already from a blue economy framework, it's pretty easy then to talk about that. And I think the other thing that's clear that I'm, I'm investigating a little bit is let's not be too comfortable by environmental impact assessment because that the traditional environmental impact assessment is useless for deep sea mining. You are talking about digging up 3,000 3, meters beyond the sea, right? Which I saw estimation that they're gonna be digging up uh, per day, two to 6 million cubic feet of marine sediments, ground rocks and stuff, and then bring it up to the surface, sift it out and throw it back in the water. You throw it back in the water, you cannot control it. It goes back, it's going, it, it has more implication than the 200 meters of our EPEEZ, right? That has regional implication. It has implication as far away as far as Caribbean and other places because you cannot control a rapidly moving current, right? So that's the respiratory function of the ocean. 
the fishes and all of the creatures that live in it will be impacting. And I was really laughing because I read that Yale study. You see that Yale study? They came. Uh, they said, oh, well, but the ocean will clean it up. So only a little bit will go back. But what we need is simulation. And I've seen a simulation that I've done when they've looked at, if you dig that up, as you said, Maureen, the scarring of the ocean bed, millennium for it to clean up, the livelihood does not return. So I think we have to really go in the direction of these simulation and not the traditional EIA. That is useless in this case. This is a whole nother ballgame that we've never, we have not seen before in, in our lives. So I think the climate link is very clear that the deep sea mining is not just the seabed issue. It involves extraction, it involves transportation, processing, and all of this are impacting the water column and the various sea surfaces and land. It's not a sea issue only. It has implications for terrestrial, um, for land and terrestrial issues. It's not gonna stay in the sea. What happened in the sea? We're not staying in the sea at the level of which we're digging into the sea. So it has implications for all of us who have coastal communities and our island nation. And it's not just, Nauru cannot just make that decision for itself because that has implication for all of us. And I think we need governments to wake up and, and, and really begin to look at that. And I'm really, I'm not comforted, but I'm glad that even some of the business communities have come out, 700 scientists have come out to say, we need to ban this or we need to moratorium it. Most scientists are saying, we need to study it. They're now finding out that a lot of the microbes have anti antibacterial that they didn't know before for human health, right? So all of these things are, are unknowns, but they're pivotal to our living. And I think, you know, our government might have been taken by this gr green growth, blue growth narrative, but now they know. They cannot say they don't know. They cannot say it's a few women who are anti-development. They now know. There's a, the body of evidence is coming out. It's not all clear in everything, but it says precautionary. It says prudence. It says take time, you know? I am not saying with that ISA will come up with a different set of rules because ISA itself is problematic. It has a moral problem. There is no way that you can be both for deep sea mm -hmm. mining and protecting the environment. Those two mandates cannot go together and that needs to be broken up. How can an institution that's benefiting from approving contract, it's get five, it gets $500,000 per contract and then it gets money. It's never yet denied a exploratory license. There's a problem there. There's a moral problem, a moral asset problem there. So it's not just our government, the international, whoever wrote that and our government agreed to it, so they are implicated in it. It makes, it's corruption at the source. You cannot have a body that's regulating for profit where its own interest and its survival depends on selling licenses and, and benefit from the profitability of the earth. That doesn't make any sense to me. I, I find that abhorrent, you know? Okay. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Mar okay. Mariam. I mean, ISA has a moral problem. Is is yeah, it's such a powerful statement. And I'm sure we all agree with that and see so evidently in all facets of our advocacy and all our different areas of work that's connected to deep sea mining, um, that this, they play a huge role as well as um, our states in ensuring that we roll back on this advance into DSM. Um, if there's anyone else um, from the panel who would like to also speak to this uh, as your final comments as we, we close. Go ahead, Uta, if I can get the... Thank you, Uta, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mariama made a very good point that the traditional environmental impact assessment is of no use in this uh, context of uh, seabed mining. And um, it is, uh, seabed mining is not consistent with Article 146 of UNCLOS, um, which aims at protection uh, of the marine environment. And uh, as well as with other, uh, many other international commitments that uh, states are, have um, signed. However, uh, the contradiction uh, between uh, the mentioned with regard to Pacific states is also something we face at the international level. I pointed to this uh, earlier, but uh, I, now I would like to underscore how absurd the situation is again, that uh, in Jamaica, UNCLOS parties uh, 
negotiate on the long-term destruction of the ocean and marine biodiversity. And in New York, UNCLOS parties and other states are negotiating on the long-term preservation of the marine biodiversity. This is absurd. And especially taking into consideration that uh, the ISA has already established its decision-making procedures, its regulations. So they are now accelerating their negotiations that may be finalized and uh, may, uh, so, so mining may start before the BDNJ agreement comes in place. So uh, we may face a situation that the biodiversity is already lost when the instrument comes in place uh, to protect it. Mm -hmm. And um, what is important that in New York, um, we have uh, in the draft um, understanding of uh, environmental um, impact under the term environmental impact assessment. It's also in the draft uh, that um, a concept of environmental impact assessment taking into con consideration cumulative impact, including climate change, socioeconomic impacts, cultural impacts, and um, so this is a more uh, comprehensive understanding. And of course, this contradicts seabed mining. And um, it is also discussed with regard to um, strategic assessment and planning, uh, marine special planning. So which is a broader um, process and also involving review and uh, adjustment of regulations, which is not um, addressed in the ISA so far. And uh, the question is, and this is really, this is something we need to raise awareness to, that um, what is negotiated at both sides there currently and also elsewhere is so, so tremendously important to life on this planet. And we must not leave it to parties of the UNCLOS negotiating uh, more or less among themselves without a public attention to this. And um, with based on a, on a concept, based on a, a regulation that come uh, that originate from the 70s, well ahead from the crises we are facing now, and um, so this must not become reality. We must not allow this, and this needs public great, greater public attention and more resistance, and um, at, at all levels. And yeah. Um, to to uh, yeah, point to another uh, topic, I learned a lot in this um, panel and I take this with me and I hope we uh, continue this exchange. And I also want to point uh, to another region that is coming up that is uh, in, in a focus for mining, this is the Northern Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And unfortunately there, or uh, yeah, the situation is, is different. Um, there are no um, communities close by and uh, I'm afraid that uh, the attention, what is going there is much lower, even much lower in this area and uh, than it is in the Pacific. So it is so important what you are doing. Uh, you are a model for others, what comes ahead, what, what, comes, uh, what, what may be um, coming in other regions. And uh, so therefore it is very important to learn from your lessons and uh, to continue the exchange. Thank you. Thank you very much, Uta. Um, over to our final speakers uh, for their final uh, wrap-up comments. Um, yeah, who would like to go? Tita, would you like to make a final comment here? Before we close up. Oh, sorry. Tita, I think, thank you. I think I would like to take the opportunity to thank you for the invite. Um, it's timely, and I think uh, the experience of having the Hunga and the COVID cases in Tonga kind of like distracted um, my attention for a while. But, um, you know, this really put me right back to where I need to be um, in defending the environment where we just saw the experience. Uh, the wealth of experience of change here today is tremendous. And thank you so much um, for having a voice from Germany and a voice from um, the African states, um, it kind of bringing that flavor that despite wherever we are, you know, demonstrated, we are in the connected um, in this world by the ocean that we love to protect. 
Thank you. Thank you, Tita. Over to you, Maureen, to close us off. Thank you. Um, really, just to say, I think we all fully understand what is at stake now. And I think it's very clear that we need to join together. Um, as Puta, Puta points out, it's not over. And we still have some time to really stop this. So please sign the petition. Uh, we've posted it on uh, the chat in the chat box because we do have to signal very strongly um, to the UNGA that ISA's mandate doesn't go far enough in protecting um, the ocean and its life-giving services. So the fight is not over. Join us, sign the petition. Um, there's many of us working on this front. Uh, yes, yeah, so please do keep in touch with us. Um, this campaign will still go on and we need every one of us taking a stake in the common heritage of all of us, on behalf of all of us. So join us. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank and you. Thank, you. thank you to our speakers, our panelists today. I mean, yes, I reiterate what Tita said. This is just, you know, great speakers, great exchange, and it's really fired um, the fire in my belly to continue and to, you know, to, to continue these conversations, but most importantly, continue to fight and, um, you know, promote the banning of deep sea mining. Um, to, our, to our participants who stayed on, uh, you know, beyond the time as well, fully engaged. Thank you also for your time and look forward to um, you know, engaging in more of these conversations online and hopefully face-to-face -face soon. Um, good luck to Maureen and Uta who are at the BBNJ or covering BBJ at the moment and CBD and taking our fight at the international stage. Thank you all. Have a great uh, remainder of your day or the start to the day or close to the day. Thank you for your time. This recording for this video will be posted online uh, on YouTube and Dawn's page. So uh, please share with your networks because this is such a great discussion. There's so many key points and we'll sh try and share it with the I uh, guys at the ISA as well, because as Uta said, it's quite absurd what's happening up there. So thank you very much. And uh, rest well, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn and uh, Pine. Naka. Thank you, Uta. Thank you so much for your work.